The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us today for a webinar on opportunities for fintech to scale up finance for green energy. Uh, we would like to ask you kindly to bear with us with a couple, uh, for a couple of minutes as we wait for more participants to join us. Thank you. So good morning, good afternoon. Once again, thank you all for joining us today for our webinar on opportunities for fintech to scale up finance for clean energy. I'm Annie Bertoli from the Strategic Initiatives Office of the International Energy Agency, and I'm joined by my colleague Vida Rosite, who will help moderate the Q&A session, and by Oliver Parada and Josie Danton, who are supporting us behind the scenes. I hope that you, your families and friends are well and remain so. We are in a non-presidented situation. Uh, the IA is hard at work on developing analyses and policies recommendations to support governments, especially on how the economic stimulus can be used to support clean energy transitions. We are also continuing to fo focus our work on digitalization and power system modernization and how to ensure efficient operation and continued resilience of power systems. This is uh, our uh, webinar number seven in the series on modernizing energy efficiency through digitalization, where we're focusing on how digital solutions can make end use efficiency cheaper, easier, and more appealing across sectors, how they can make policy making more effective through access to more granular data, new types of data and advanced analytics, and how digital technologies can promote energy efficiency across systems, including electricity systems. So in our recent analysis, we're seeing that energy efficiency investment is not enough to meet sustainability goals. However, there seems to be a high potential for energy efficiency investments that remains untapped in many countries. As we will see today and in this context, uh, fintech can offer an opportunity to leverage digitalization and overcome a range of persistent barriers in the sphere. So uh, if we go back to the agenda, uh, we can see that in today's webinar, we will have the opportunity to explore how digital technologies are supporting the development of new financing vehicles for renewables and on their potential applicability for finance uh, energy efficiency projects as well. And experts will also explain how blockchain technology can revolutionize the green bond market and how countries like Indonesia 
actually applying these technologies to attract and raise capital for new investors. So the presentations will be followed by a question and answer session and interval with interactive polling to make the discussion more dynamic. Uh, you will see uh, uh, on your right uh, the settings and uh, please use the, the questions uh, chat box in your control panel uh, to ask for any questions. We will select and read them out at the end of the presentations. Of course, we will not mention the names of people asking questions, so please feel free also to use this opportunity to suggest other topics or aspects that you would like uh, to, be, to hear more about in future webinars. Let me also remind you that the webinar is recorded and the recording and the presentations will be available online. We'll send you an email with the link in the coming days. Now, um, as you can see from this slide, the first one is me, and then um, I would add a few words on our esteemed speakers that we thank for being with us today, starting with Cecilia. So Cecilia heads up the OECD Clean Energy Finance and Investment Mobilization Program. This new program works with emerging economies to help strengthen their enabling frameworks to facilitate more private sector finance and investment in energy efficiency and renewable energy. And today she will provide a framing on this topic. Now, if we move on to the next slide, we'll see our uh, guest speakers, starting with Marianne Haar, who is the Director of Green Energy Digital Finance Alliance, which has the objective to harness fintech to unlock financing for SDGs and the Paris Agreement. This is a public-private partnership between UNEP and Ant Financial Services Group. And Marianne will guide us through how digitalization can help to scale up and lower the costs of green bonds, including the role it could play in energy efficiency finance. And Jacob is the co-founder of Cotacal Business Solutions, a design firm using technology to address sustainable development goals. In the renewable energy space, the firm has been working on blockchain in relation with green projects, green bonds, and with energy tokenization. This pioneering work includes combining blockchain and IoT devices while integrating to the electric, to the electric grid. And he will guide, guide us through how this technology works. And last but not least, we uh, were welcoming Dwi Riantian in India, who is Director of uh, Islamic Financing at the Director General of Budget Financing and Risk Management, Ministry of Finance of the Republic of Indonesia. And she is experienced in the field of Indonesia capital market, regulation and law, and she has been involved in the development of Suku Kunigara from the beginning. So today we're really excited to, to hear about uh, her experience in implementing retail green Suku in Indonesia. And now, before passing the floor to Cecilia, I'd actually like to get a quick picture of who is with us today. So if we move to the next slide, I would kindly ask you to go to www.menti.com. You will see there, like from, you can use both your phone and your computer, and you can see on the screen a code. So please insert um, the code that you will see shortly on the web page. And uh, um, I will also ask you, let's say, to keep this web page open because we will be using this tool throughout our presentation uh, in order to make the discussion hopefully more dynamic. So please, um, the code is 203273. Uh, of course, these options uh, don't include all, all different kinds of organizations, but please do choose the one which is more I say similar to uh, to yours. So with the uh, we started to see that we we have uh, a lot of people with us from from especially from research and geos and international organizations, but also the final sector the final sector, more and more from the technology provider and other industries. So this is interesting because it gives us the information that actually our audience is quite um, is quite diverse. So thank you for being with us. We will uh, wait for a couple of seconds here and then we, we will move on to the next question.
All right. So uh, we can see here that our main, uh, let's say, organization across the, the table are more uh, research and geos international organizations, but also government and technology. So yeah, really interesting to have a, a quite diverse mix. So we can now move to the next question. So we would also uh, like to know from you, uh, and also to give a context related to the, this webinar related on what is uh, the maturity level of, uh, of FinTech for clean energy finance in your jurisdiction. Of course, we start to know, so um, no transactions were, were actually completed, nascent with the first, first or some of the first transactions happening and growing number. So again, what is interesting to see here is that actually we have uh, a quite broad, uh, let's say, set of maturity levels, and which is quite uh, balanced as well. All right, so we will allow a couple of, uh, of seconds more for you to answer before moving on to the next speaker. All right, so what we can see is that um, for, for 18 among you, uh, the, the fintech uh, uh, for, for clean energy finance is actually non-existent. So it might be interesting for you, let's say, to see how this can actually be implemented and provide opportunities. And, and actually for the majority of you, this is in a nascent phase, uh, which is understandable. Like there are a lot of experiments happening in several countries. And, uh, and you will see uh, from the experience of Indonesia and also uh, hearing about the general framework, how, how this can actually be implemented and scaled up. And we're happy also to see that for 24 of you, like you live in a jurisdiction where, uh, let's say, this kind of um, framework is actually growing and a number of players are, are becoming established in this market. Okay, now, um, thank you all for, for taking time to answer these questions. We will have more, as I said, during the presentation. And now uh, I will pass the floor to Cecilia to give us a, a general intro and, uh, and framing. So the floor is yours, Cecilia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emmy. Um, and I'd like to also just add my welcome to the participants of this webinar. Um, we at the OECD are very pleased to be part of the IEA's digitalization series of webinars and thank the IEA team for inviting us to co-host uh, today's session. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with the OECD, we are an intergovernmental organization that, uh, sorry, we are the only intergovernmental uh, organization that works across all branches of, of government. Um, we support our, our governments in building better policies for, for better lives. Um, our Center for Green Finance and Investment provides cutting-edge analysis to support policymaking and organizes the annual forum on green finance and investment, which will be held this year um, on 8 and 9 October. The Center leverages the OECD's policy and economics expertise and provides a global platform for engagement among leaders from industry, finance, government, and regulatory institutions, academia, and civil society. Um, next slide, please. Today's webinar is part of the OECD's Clean Energy Finance and Investment Mobilization Program, um, which is an activity of the Center for Green Finance and Investment. This program, supported by the government of Denmark, works closely with emerging economies to help improve their policy framework for clean energy finance 
and investment. Uh, its four main activities shown here include a holistic approach to country policy reviews to support clean energy finance and investment, technical assistance to support the development and implementation of clean energy finance policies, investor dialogues to help support the development of scalable pipelines of clean energy projects, and regional peer learning events. With less developed financial markets, emerging economies face even greater challenges to raise affordable capital to support their country's clean energy transition. The CEFM program will assist countries to overcome some of these challenges and help to create a robust clean energy finance and investment environment. Next slide, please. Um, for us, digitalization will be an important enabler for this transition. Recognizing the growing importance of digitalization in our economies, the OECD has been examining how digital transformation affects policymaking across a large spectrum of policy areas. The breadth of the work is too wide to summarize here, but I'd like to highlight one recent report which looks at blockchain technologies as a digital enabler for sustainable infrastructure. The report looks at how blockchain technology can unlock financing platforms, provide visibility and alignment to climate goals through the provision of data and analytics, and how it can enhance awareness and access by acting as a transaction enabler of new market models. The publication is one of a number of case studies developed as part of the OECD's Financing Climate Futures Report that looks at six uh, transformative areas to align financial flows with low emissions, resilient infrastructure investments. Um, one of these is innovation in technologies, institutions, and business models. Next slide, please. Um, achieving the clean energy transition will require unprecedented changes in the energy system. The figure on the left illustrates the future clean energy system, which is integrated um, across energy sectors and carriers, and a shift from decentralized to, um, sorry, from centralized to decentralized energy systems. Digitalization will play a growing role in the energy sector, and the IEA's digitalization webinar series has already covered many of these areas. The transition also requires unprecedented changes in the financial markets. Um, and as you can see in the figure on the right, we will also need to move from a, a centralized a, a banking sector to one um, which is growingly more uh, decentralized. Um, Digitalization tech, digital technologies offer innovative financing solutions to emerge. The webinar today explores how these technologies are starting to create new financing vehicles. Our three expert speakers will explain how blockchain technology can revolutionize the green bond market, how sensors and digital platforms are making it cheaper and easier to finance smaller scale energy efficiency and renewable energy projects and how Indonesia has already used digital technologies to attract and raise capital from new investors. But before inviting our speakers um, to, uh, to speak, we would like to turn our audience uh, to have your input. Um, could I have the next set of polling questions, please? And if you have not already logged into the Menti system, uh, the link and code can be found on top, uh, right, on, can be found on top of your screen. So our first question, um, what do you see as the leading driver for its fintech development in the clean energy sector? Uh, as a platform to match project developers and investors? B, for verification and monitoring of performance of energy assets? C, standardization and an ability to aggregate smaller projects? D, demand for small investors to invest directly in clean energy projects? And finally, to use as tokenization to lower currency conversion costs. Uh, we will pause while uh, people submit their, their answers. Uh, all right, so very interesting. We see about um, a third uh, of the people believe that it'll be most useful for matching project developers with investors. 
um, that share is growing. At the start of the polling, um, many people felt that this would allow demand from smaller investors to invest directly in clean energy projects. And a, a smaller group feel that it'll be used for standardization to help aggregate smaller projects, as well as for monitoring of performance. And, and interestingly, nobody's looking at this um, for lowering uh, currency conversion costs. Uh, could I have the next uh, question, please, on the screen? Um, so the next question, uh, what are the main benefits of digitizing green bonds? I encourage you to use or limit your answer to just one to three words. Uh, for example, for transparency, cost reduction, or increased access. Please submit your answers. Um, and we will pause for a few seconds as the audience submits their suggestions. All right, so it looks like um, the two highest or the two most popular answers so far have been to help improve transparency and access. Um, and also to help improve efficiency and, uh, and raise awareness. All right. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for, for participating in, in this. Um, now, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Marianne Haar, Executive Director of the Green Digital Finance Alliance. Marianne, the floor is yours. Thank you, Cecilia, and uh, great to meet you, everyone. So um, this presentation will take a broader look at uh, currently FinTech is redesigning the financial system. Uh, at, at instrument and at regulation level. So this uh, will look at what are the opportunities to then also bring uh, this redesign of financial instruments to innovate energy efficiency products. Um, next slide, please. Um, it's important to also in the beginning highlight that FinTech also does not only bring opportunities to energy efficiency finance, it of course also introduces new risks and especially the risk of uh, that comes from the fact that the algorithms that powers these new financial instruments also have, for some of them, a significant energy footprint. I will not focus on the risk side in this presentation. In this short, short presentation, I will walk you through some of the opportunities to innovate financial instruments. Um, and I have chosen today uh, to share with you a number of the capabilities as the opening slide that FinTech brings to energy efficiency finance. I've sampled three of the main challenges where fintech uh, that are specific to energy efficiency finance, where fintech has something special to offer. The first one is the, the relatively small size uh, of energy efficiency assets and projects, and also the nature of the revenue models, that they are mainly based on savings rather than on following uh, the building out of a physical infrastructure, and that demands different types of metrics uh, for financiers. The second challenge is the high perceived risk cost, which pushes up both the cost of capital uh, on energy efficiency uh, projects and translate into a lower uh, confidence at the level of, of financial service institutions. And then what Cecilia also mentioned that it's, it's less of a standardized uh, market for financial products because of the fact that it acts differently. It cuts across existing asset classes such as transport uh, and, and such as um, housing, et cetera. So some of the capabilities, the first cost of capabilities that Cecilia also mentioned, and which is the obvious one, is the data, that we get more data and better data, especially that we now can get asset level data. And asset level data can, can make um, the financing models around these and the revenue models um, more tangible, but that the data can also be reported by the asset itself, via IoT and, and intelligent chips directly in the assets, and that that can be verified by um, locking it on to a DLT or distributed ledger technology. So that opens up for that we can make energy uh, efficiency uh, investments much more predictable uh, and that we can able asset forecasting in entirely new ways. Um, the second capability which is important uh, to address the barriers of energy efficiency finance is the ability to aggregate. 
So that enables us to think about scaling finance in a totally different way. So I think Cecilia also mentioned it, that we can aggregate at the investor demand side. So we can crowd in new types of investors with risk profiles that matches better energy efficiency finance that have a higher risk appetite. But we can also aggregate at the energy efficiency asset level um, and we can do it in new ways. So we can package energy efficiency um, assets across different risk profiles and then offer the investment as an average of the risk profile to investors. So we can actually cross subsidize those that have a higher risk profile or perceived risk profile. The third cluster of, of opportunities is in the behavioral space. And that is both in relation to um, the data capabilities that it brings us to the retail level. Uh, so we can actually reward uh, in new ways, energy efficient behaviors uh, via gamification, but also at the corporate level uh, where we can um, much more clearly uh, and based on impact data, start to integrate energy efficiency impact into ESG automated ratings. At the moment, it's mainly when it comes to ESG, uh, labeled products, it mainly measures the corporate performance on a policy level rather than on an impact level. And also that introduces um, energy efficiency tracking in an automated and more cost efficient way, way at the SME asset class level. Uh, next slide, please. So over the next um, five to, to, to six minutes, I will take you through showing how these capabilities can open up uh, new financing avenues and I'll go through three financing avenues starting in the middle looking at e-asset management, robo-advisory and crowd financing, uh, then looking at green bonds, digitization of green bonds to unlock energy efficiency finance and then looking at uh, starting to build energy efficiency uh, automated metrics into financial decision making algorithms. Next slide please. So if we look at um, aggregation of investors to crowd in uh, more capital into energy efficiency finance, I have taken Germany on this slide as the example because we've done quite a lot of deep dive work in Germany and also because Germany is the country with the largest number of renewable energy crowdfunding platforms. If you see, if you look at the ESG or the SDG wheel in the middle and you have numbers on each of the colors of the SDGs, that is uh, looking at the entire fintech landscape in Germany, which is 700 plus fintechs, and looking at what percentage of fintechs deliver uh, innovative financing for which SDGs. Then you can see on SDG 7 for clean energy, 16% of all fintechs in Germany actually uh, deliver innovative financing solutions to uh, clean energy. And if we look at that at the European level, then a few years ago there were 23 active crowdfunding platforms for renewable energy across the union, uh, men, most of them for renewable energy access, uh, but 17% of the platforms have also projects and assets for combined heat and power, 17% have for relightning and 9% for insulation. So some of them do include energy efficiency projects and assets. If you look at the main business segments that these um, innovative financing models are coming out of, it's mainly in the robo advisory uh, and it's mainly in uh, crowd, crowd, uh, crowd financing. Um, and if you look at the main technologies that are currently powering uh, these innovative financing models, then you can see that they are relatively on the graph. You can see that they're relatively low tech or they're relatively light on integrating uh, automated um, harvesting of metrics from the asset. Basically, you can see that they're pretty low in integrating IoT. So that would be a next step and that reflects how, how it looks globally. So that would be a next step for, for further uh, digitizing these. But to really scale uh, crowdfunding for energy efficiency, uh, there would need to be uh, more blended financing vehicles. So bring in more concessional funding, uh, on these platforms and bring in also institutional funding uh, to really increase, uh, increase this financing vehicle and especially that would be important for emerging markets and also um, working on regulatory clarity of crowdfunding in a lot of developing markets. That's not necessarily the case at the moment. If we look at robo-advisory, then that's a segment of fintech that is scaling really fast uh, and also green robo-advisory. And, and what they do generally is that instead of um, 
channeling capital into smaller projects as crowdfunding do. What they do is that they crowd in retail investment capital uh, into, ES, into listed markets. So basically what's important if we want robo, green robo-advisory to channel more funding into energy efficiency projects uh, or ESG uh, listed, um, listed market, then we need to make sure that the ESG criteria also uh, work on energy efficiency impact for, for this to be a, a scaling mechanism for energy efficiency finance. Um, next slide, please. The next slide is on digitization of green bonds because energy dominates the use of proceeds for the green bond market. So you could ask yourself, well, why talk about digitization of green bonds? Because the bond market is, is highly digitized. Uh, in this context, I talk about it in relation to um, digitizing by using the second generation of technologies. So using digi distributed ledger technologies and using IoT and AI for automated harvesting uh, directly from the asset. What you can see in the first step is that we did the state of the market of green uh, digitization of green bonds uh, by incumbents. And it's quite clear that that's, that's, that's just started in 18, that blockchain powered green bonds left the innovation labs of incumbents and entered the market. And then BBVA did an issuance uh, of a digitized or blockchain powered green bond uh, in, in, in the European Union last year, but we haven't seen any fully end-to-end -end digitized green bonds and energy efficiency. Um, but it's bound to happen with time. What has been holding it back has been a lack of regulatory clarity on crypto assets in a number of jurisdictions, but um, that is growing uh, really rapidly and policymakers and regulators are, are, are working on that. So this is an avenue to scale energy efficiency finance through rendering green bonds more efficient. And that is basically by um, automating the book building, by reducing settlement times from, from days uh, to seconds, but also ultimately to, um, to automate the harvesting on data for the use of proceeds directly from the energy efficiency assets. What it opens up to is the second step that you see on the slide, which is to innovate uh, green bonds with security token offerings for energy efficiency. And that is basically that it allows you to issue much smaller green bonds in a cost efficient manner. Um, and that would help us to uh, overcome the barrier of the mismatch between the size of the energy efficiency asset and, and, the, and the needs from the investors. So it can crowd in new types of investors. Um, we haven't, we have seen in the, la in the first 10 years of last year, we saw 300 and and, and 80 token offerings uh, at a value of 4.1 billion USD. None of them were specifically for energy efficiency, but in the top 15, there was one that were related to the energy market, which was around um, IoT uh, and automated transaction from IoT devices. Um, then lastly, it opens up for innovating entirely new ways of building projects that translate savings in energy into assets or into a currency. Uh, and there are quite a number of these in the markets, uh, which are around that uh, with smart grids, you can, um, your energy savings, you can sell them to your neighbor. So they basically become an income to you and become part of your, your own accounting. At the institutional level, it opens up for much more automated tacking of, um, of the asset performance and packaging um, of energy efficiency assets into more standardized financial products. Uh, next slide, please. Then uh, the most scaled fintech application across all markets is automated credit scoring. And um, when, 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 you, when you look into what are the reasons for SMEs uh, not to implement energy efficiency measures that's been highlighted in energy audits, mainly access to capital and the cost of capital comes up. Um, so what we are currently looking at and where we see great potential uh, is to integrate green scoring into automated credit scoring and that parts of these green scores will be based on the energy efficiency performance of the SME and then making the cost of capital dependent on, on the energy efficiency and the green scoring performance. Uh, we're looking right now uh, with my bank and IFC in China on exactly this um, because we see that it's, it's, it's a great opportunity and a way for SMEs to get access to, to, to lower cost uh, cost of capital, but also to be rewarded 
for, for really changing their energy efficiency in their production. Um, and it can open the way for, for building of new types of, of green SME asset classes. Next slide, please. Uh, lastly, behaviors uh, at the retail level. Um, there are quite a number of, they're not called energy efficiency uh, mobile wallets, but there are a number of, of mobile wallets that build in now green functionalities so that you as a user, we work with Ant Forest in China, for instance, that if, if you agree to it, then you will have 18 behaviors tracked. And some of these are about how energy efficient is your tra transport choices. And then you get rewarded uh, by green points that you can then uh, exchange for other issues uh, and they gamify uh, they gamify uh, your behaviors so basically it's 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 it, it uses network effects to establish green as the new behavioral norm um, next slide please so these were were were, were a number of avenues uh, some of them more mature than others but uh, I want to thank you for, for listening and looking forward to the conversation. Thank you very much, Marianne, for your excellent presentation. Um, I just want to follow up with, with one question, if I may. Um, does the digitization of green bonds help to expand domestic markets for clean energy finance, or are they more targeting international investors? Well, at the moment, um, at the moment, the, the, the ones we have seen issued uh, have been globally uh, crowding global investors and investors have been very very interested so those that have been blockchain powered have been oversubscribed um, in a very short period of time and what the investor feedback has been from that is that it allows them to get much closer to the asset uh, because now you don't have to have investor meetings at regular intervals you just get the information right on your smartphone uh, on how your green green asset is performing or your green investment is performing. But it is especially interesting uh, for developing markets uh, where you have thinner capital markets and where you really can leverage um, digitization of green bonds to um, change the perceived high risk of green bonds in developing markets. Because when you get uh, automated harvesting of use of proceeds and, and proof of impact reporting, um, directly from the asset, then of course that will that will have an impact on on the risk profiling and the confidence in the instrument, and also because of the fact that um, in a lot of developing markets uh, the energy efficiency projects in agricultural value chains, for instance, are smaller, uh, so they match better uh, the smaller green instruments that digital opens up for. So I see the much greater potential for this in developing markets. Great. And um, can you say a few words on, on the investors who are subscribing? Are these large institutional investors or are these more traditional, uh, perhaps retail investors hoping to get closer to, to the assets? Well, if, if you look at the STO, so the security token offerings, then it depends on the regulation. So if you are in the US, it has to be accredited investors. For a number of jurisdictions, you have to be an accredited, accredited investor still to invest in an STO. If you look at those green bonds that have been issued by incumbents, so by the World Bank, et cetera, BBVA, then these have been to a large extent institutional investors. There have been a few that have not been able because of their own internal regulation about custodianship, for instance, not to, uh, to invest in a blockchain powered bonds because it takes out a number of, of, uh, of the sort of the role of the custodianship. So, so it's still, it still hasn't, fully, fully democratize the investment chain. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so now I'd like to turn to our, our next speaker, uh, Jacob Neenan, uh, who's co-founder of uh, Kotakal Business Solutions. Um, Jacob, over to you. Uh, thanks, Cecilia. Um, so uh, let me start with, uh, uh, with the first slide. Can we move to the first slide, please? Uh, so we, uh, it's estimated that around 100 trillion worth of assets uh, are invested in zero interest or less. Uh, and this is just the pre-COVID figures. Huh? Uh, and uh, if you look at the other side of the equation, uh, the project developers or projects that are developing clean energy projects, uh, one of the main reasons cited uh, for difficulty in implementing projects is access to capital and cost of capital, basically. So basically, this, these are the two sides of the coin. 
so through this presentation, I'd like to actually explore from our experience uh, what were some of those reasons or and what are the ways that we can try to facilitate uh, this to go forward. So uh, in this slide, I'm just trying to set the context. So investors, when I talk about investors on one side, I'm talking about broadly project developers, project owners, state agents, et cetera, et cetera. And on the clean energy side, clean energy project side, I'm talking about project, uh, sorry, when, I, when I'm talking about pro clean energy projects, I'm talking generally on project developers, pro project owners, state agents, and so on and so forth. And on the investor side, I'm talking about banks, financial intermediaries, and so on. So the two different pieces of the puzzle. And uh, the, the, the transaction is simple. Investor lends money as long as the project promises to invest in a specific theme or a class of investment. So that's uh, the, 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 the idea behind it. And the project promises, the project developer promises to repay with full credit of his balance sheet on the, based on the agreed terms. So, the, uh, uh, so uh, the, the, this is basically the construct of how it is. Next slide, please. So what are the reasons that we have this uh, dichotomy uh, of funding on one side or money on one side parked without any much returns? And on the other side, projects which don't take off. Uh, so we have sort of in our experience with a few projects that we worked on, we found out if three main areas. One is shortage of bankable projects. So what do I mean by shortage of bankable projects? Uh, so the investor and the project developer have different set of criteria that they access, they use to access these funds. So the investor might say that he it needs to fit a particular criteria. It needs to fit a geographic region. It needs to fit a particular theme. It should be probably only for solar, et cetera, et cetera. So there are some criteria related to that. That's one of the reasons. Second is there is an investor risk reward appetite. Uh, he probably the investor doesn't want to invest in an emerging market. Uh, and again, uh, the other other uh, other reason could be uh, that uh, the uh, the project is in an emerging market and uh, they are not having the visibility or the ability to uh, to get funds from international markets. So there are that mismatch that happens. Uh, as well as the project credibility and the trust related uh, uh, leads to a shortage of bankable projects. Uh, the next uh, uh, idea is around generic funding that is available. So today, if you look at a benchmark figure or ticket size, it's around 100 million. If you go for a green bond, it's around 100 million, that minimum that you need to look at to have a, uh, a interest from the bank. Uh, and any figure lower than that, the, the, the level of interest for the banks decrease as the numbers reduce. For smaller countries, a 20 million project does add value to the to their project development. Uh, so that's that's a little difficult to find. Uh, the, the, there's an aspect of transaction fees. There's an aspect of actually having the unit cost. So if you want to buy a bond uh, or you want to buy, have an investor, a retail investor, invest into a product, can, can it be done with 500 US dollars or 100 US dollars? So uh the, the 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 products that are in the market today are more targeting towards a specific uh, uh specific set of clients uh the other pro point is around the local projects that are there if a municipality in a in a in a in sri lanka wants to put up a power plant uh the local municipality would would be willing to put the money in there might be people in the locality who might be interested in the project. There might be expats from that municipality who might want to invest back into their country. So the, 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 the options for that, plus the international investors, if they come together, there's a possibility for more projects to get off the ground. So uh, this, is the, uh, this is one of the uh, ideas around generic funding. The last one we are talking about is the opaqueness of the, uh, of the product itself. Uh, so, for example, most of these products issuance and the management of it uh, is is done by the stakeholders themselves. Uh, there's no, the transparency to all the complete ecosystem is not always there. How the proceeds are used, how it has been uh, uh, been uh, tracked, and so on and so forth are not completely transparent. So, there these are some of these issues that we we see in the market currently. Next slide, please. 
Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, with, with our experience with our customers, these, with these problems that we see, we use the tools that are available today to try to bring a solution to it. Uh, and we have used mainly three uh, three buckets of of, of, uh, of ideas around. So one is digitization and digitization, Marianne talked about not digitization one, which is already available. People already do digitization, but across the life cycle of that project. Uh, when I mean life cycle, not only the funding part, but also the outcome tracking, meaning that you have a, a sensor or a uh, or IoT on the uh, asset and are able to get that information from the asset into the uh, into the platform and disseminate it to the investors on real time all the time right so that's the first part the second is around data uh, blockchain of course provides uh, the immutability of the records so if you make a record if you make an entry into the blockchain uh, it is immutable it is date stamped and it cannot be changed so uh, so this is a very important aspect. We can actually use this for, uh, for, uh, for a lot of our business uh, uh, interests. Uh, the last one is about trust uh, and trust meaning that we have a very secure uh, system which can be, uh, which whereby we can do audit trails and we can also do uh, milestone based uh, uh, funding uh, because uh, if you use a sort of uh, tools like DLT or blockchain today, you can actually trigger act actions based on some uh, criteria being met. Uh, and I'll explain uh, uh, all these three buckets uh, over the next use cases that I have uh, that will uh, that will uh, uh, that will be uh, more uh, uh, easier to understand. Next slide, please. Okay, so like I said, we 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 are talking about three uh, main uh, pieces to it: uh, the blockchain, of course, immutable record, IoT. At the very e simplistic way, it is it's probably a a, a, a sensor which which uh, gets the information from the asset and writes it to the uh, and we are able to write it into the uh, blockchain. Uh, and then we have a smart infrastructure: the internet, Wi-Fi, and so on and so forth. One of the pieces that I've not mentioned here is the uh, intelligence part, the AI piece. Once we have blockchain enabled data, which is authentic data or data that is written uh, or in real time, that information can be used uh, to trigger business, uh, uh, business models and ideas beyond what we discussed as well. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so let me just go through uh, the the cycle of uh, of uh, financing that we have uh, worked with some companies to 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 uh, to fine tune. Uh, we have something called a pre-development phase. So pre-development is not um, it, it's a phase whereby the idea is formed. Idea for putting up a geothermal plant, for example, in Vietnam, is formed. Now you want to prepare the project for funding. So you have a bunch of uh, requirements that need to be fulfilled. There needs to be a project plan. There needs to be a business plan. There needs to be approvals in place, et cetera, et cetera. And there needs to be some funding for that. That's, a, let's say, a, a initial funding, a small amount to get it going. Uh, so in this case, what happened is that the, the project was actually funded by a grant from a, a development agency. And once that is complete, uh, then the project can actually, and this takes over a year, during this year, the whole information is tracked and uh, uh, and uh, made available on the on the platform, so people can see the the progression of that project over a period of time. So over one year, you can see that okay, this project has completed its its uh, governmental approvals, it has done its uh, technical surveys, it has done its environmental clearance. So you see that information already before the project even comes in for funding. Uh, and over a period of time that uh, the audit reports, the, uh, the government certificates, all are already uploaded. And the confidence level because of that uh, can is, increases to the investor. Uh, so after the pre-development, the project actually comes for funding to the, uh, uh, to, uh, to the investors. And uh, at this point of time, it can be a green bond. It can be 
different instruments, but basically uh, one already has the information related to that project. Uh, and uh, the platform uses it to uh, uh, uses it to crowdfund that amount. The last part is project oper operationalization. Here, we are talking about uh, uh, not only automating the returns, uh, returns of uh, of uh, of well, if it's a green bond, it's uh, automating the coupon rate uh, uh, distribution, but also the governance around it, the import Im impact reports. Uh, as well as being able to real time see the amount of energy that is generated at the uh, at the asset level next slide please so i'm going to talk about a few use cases quickly uh, uh, just to give an idea so this is the pre development funding use case we talked about so you have a bunch of tasks uh, so it can be uh, uh, secure permits and clearances. You have uh, subtasks to it. You have a start date and end date. You have the owners for it. So you have a project management unit and department of energy in this case. And there are files for it. So if there is a, a local government unit endorsement, so you have a file that needs to upload be uploaded. That's a certificate for from the local government uh, that uh, this has been uh, this project has been approved, uh, and that uh, can be uploaded as well. And uh, the upload date and the verified date is also there. So uh, this is this is the uh, this is uh, this sort of project-based uh, or milestone-based uh, plan uh, over a period of one year or whatever that time takes to finish the pre-development phase already gives the visibility to the interested parties much before the project comes in for funding. Uh, so uh, I, I'd like to just mention one more thing here. Uh, so here you can also make payments based on achieving of milestones. For example, uh, if you say that uh, there is a multi-signature uh, subtask or a task, uh, let's say the environment clearance has, as the environment clearance is complete, make a payment of 20% to the contractor. Uh, so you can say that this task uh, uh, as it is uh, complete, the certificate is uploaded and it is verified by the PMU and the Department of Energy automatically make the payment of X amount to the contractor. So this kind of smart contract based uh, automation is also possible. We have not really done it in the project, but it is it is something that we have uh, we have tried it in a lab environment, but and that works. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the next use case we are talking about is a plain uh, green bonds project. It's uh, it's a green bond uh, issuance that we uh, that that is done for uh, what we have found is at lower ticket sizes, uh, which can be uh, reconciled faster. You don't need to wait for T plus one or T plus two, depending on the jurisdiction you are. Uh, based in uh, the transaction fees are less uh, you can uh, the project can list they can uh, the investors can find projects which are uh, which they are interested in they can invest uh, and the whole uh, uh, investment and funding operation can happen uh, on uh, through the platform uh, also the other part is that the use of proceeds could also be tracked so if you have a hundred uh, dollar uh, collected, you can actually be uh, in, um, uh, have the earlier project management or pre-development tool customized to say that if the project finishes its 20% uh, uh, of its work, like for example, uh, its clearance of its uh, its, uh, its uh, site, uh, pay 10%. That can be done. So even at, we can uh, take that pre-development. And port it into uh, into this section, whereby we can uh, add more level of uh, transparency into the project. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, the third use case is basically a project discovery and matching platform. Uh, so here, what happens is that uh, you have uh, investors who have different interests and have different uh, uh, 
uh, areas where they would like to in invest. So you can search by type, theme, uh, or you can search by uh, uh, the coupon rate, the geographic location, uh, whether you want to do energy efficiency projects, you want to do energy adaptation, mob uh, mobility projects. So you can, we, we are providing a platform whereby you can search and find the information related to it. You can find the prospectors, you can find all details related to it. You can find the auditor's report, the, the, uh, the re information related to it, and you can uh, uh, decide on whether you want to invest or not. So this is just a project discovery and matching platform. You can, we do it for both the pre-development projects as well as the funding projects or, or the uh, main uh, green bond funding uh, sort of projects. So both these can be uh, done as well. The last use case, next uh, slide, please. The next, uh, uh, the last use case is basically uh, just showing how uh, how our water uh, smart meter, which is a digital smart meter, which we have done, uh, is a, a digital representation of the smart meter that is there at the asset uh, that that is being tracked. So you have the energy that is generated from there. Uh, uh, there is something called tokenization, which is basically a digital representation of the energy that is there. So if you, uh, it can be done for physical items, it can be done for digital, and we have done it for the digital part. So you, we actually tag it to a token. So if you have 10,000 units of energy generated from a plant in Vietnam, that can be tagged as a token, and that token will show the proof of origin of that energy source uh, or that energy. It can be traded, it can be, I mean, there are other things that can be done here, but I I think broadly the idea is that we are able to track from the asset how much energy is produced over a period of time. Uh, last slide, please. So what did we learn from this? I think this is the most important uh, uh, slide, I think, of the, uh, of the presentation for me. Uh, so, we, we, the, 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 there are project uh, uh, project finance uh, instruments available, uh, but I think for for the for the customers that we talk to, they, uh, they, there definitely needs to be some customization. There needs to be some customization based on their needs, based on uh, their projects and their context. Uh, so to give you an example, like I said, there is a hundred million ticket uh, interest from a financing side but maybe the project is only 20 million that is needed. Uh, and so that, that needs to actually uh, cater to that segment. Uh, the second point is around a simple and transparent process. Uh, so today, if you, if you have to raise funds, uh, the process is, uh, involves a lot of stakeholders. Uh, it's a complicated process. It's, uh, it, 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 and and it's, a, it, it's not so easy to just for anyone to just go and raise funds, uh, we we think that it is it should be at least for uh, smaller projects, and for uh, for pre-development for some types of projects. This can be simplified much more. Uh, projects can be made bankable uh, by making it simple, quicker, and then uh, periodically the risk can be tracked so that the the investors could also get a, a understanding on how the risk has been changing. Uh, so uh, something similar to what the VC industry, the venture cap industry, uh, has come out with a simple agreement for future uh, equity, safe uh, from Y Combinator. It's a one-page document for funding for startups. Uh, similar to that, something like that should be. We should come out with some uh, some instruments uh, which could help us make it standard and help for us uh, for the projects to go forward. The last one is about blended finance for preparing the bankable projects. So here, uh, like I said, we have this pre-development phase where we try to uh, ex uh, we uh, surface that risk as early as possible, uh, and there's some funding, grant funding there. So if the financial institutions or the funders or investors are interest, could be participate in this project as early as possible, and come out with these blended products whereby grant or loans can be transferred to equity or transferred to investments. And then the whole project can be taken from there and sold to pension funds. I mean, I think there can be more flexibility 
in terms of the products that can be gen generated from such uh, such ideas and we have all the tools for it so uh, i think this is the right time uh, and i'm glad to take any questions at this stage thank you very much jacob for taking us through how how this platform is working um i'd now like to invite the um, ia team to turn to the mentee we're going to ask uh, participants um to give us input on one one additional question um do you agree that fintech options are suitable for the following clean energy technology so if you could vote on whether you strongly agree or disagree um whether residential rooftop solar solar pumps utility scale solar uh, green buildings energy efficiency retrofits efficient heating and cooling systems and uh, community battery storage are potential technologies that could use uh, fintech options to help scale up finance excellent we're just going to wait a second to allow people to vote interesting so overall all of these technologies uh, participants strongly agree that fintech can play a big role um, on average we're we're in the sort of four range interesting all right so um thank you very much for for these inputs encouraging to see that uh, these digital options could really make a difference on on quite a wide spectrum of of clean energy projects um i'd now like to invite our last speaker uh, to present um, Ibudwi Rianti uh, from the Ministry of Finance, uh, Director of Islamic Finance. The floor is yours. Thank you, Cecilia. <coughs> great, to meet, great to meet you, uh, everyone. Uh, here, I would like to share uh, our experience in issuing Green's uh, Retail Suko uh, <coughs> using digital platform. Next slide, please. To adapt with the <clears throat> the growing of uh, commerce uh, penetration in Indonesia shows a fantastic progress. In 2017, we found 52.5% uh, of Indonesia population as digital buyer, and it is projected to become 77.2% in 2024. The main factor that uh, drive these uh, digital buyers is the use of mobile phone. Approximately 76% uh, internet user in Indonesia using their phone for online shopping. And this number is uh, the highest around the world, with majority of internet users are uh, millennial generations, that is 17%. And the meantime, uh, the growth of online retail uh, reached 3.9 percent year on year in 2018. That uh, background why we uh, introduce the online uh, system and develop uh, the this digital platform to uh, issue our retail suko. Next slide, please. To adapt with digital trend and technology, Ministry of Finance uh, has developed uh, ESPN system. So the name of the system, uh, we call it ESPN, uh, Electronic uh, Government Securities. Uh, amazingly, that uh, this process of developing the system, we utilize uh, our own resources, especially millennial staff. So without involving any uh, external IT providers, so uh, costless in these uh, things. Uh, this system, when we use uh, this system, we found uh, several advantages. First, uh, it was 24 hours access from anywhere and anytime during the offer period. So uh, people can buy uh, from anywhere. And uh, the investor uh, just use their uh, smartphone smartphone uh, and can be accessed from uh, in their own smartphone to buy our suko. And the other advantage uh, that 
there is very convenient for investor because they don't need to come to uh, the bank to buy our suko and uh, lastly the system promotes fairness treatment to all investor because uh, we use first come first serve method in this case next slide please how to buy uh, our suko <clears throat> There are uh, four steps, but before I uh, explain about the steps, we appoint 28 selling agents consists of bank, securities, uh, companies, and uh, fintech companies, but all the selling agents should develop a system that meet our uh, digital platform and should integrate it uh, to our system. There are four uh, simple steps to buy uh, our suko. <clears throat> First, the investor should uh, investor should sorry investor should uh, create single investor identification or SID and also uh, securities account. And after they get a uh, SID, they can start to put their order via agents electronic system and need to confirm that uh, they are fully understand uh, of all the terms and conditions. So uh, we put the <clears throat> offering memorandum documents in our system so investor can easily uh, read uh, the whole uh, documents if they want. But uh, usually they just uh, skip uh, this term and condition because they trust to the government that this uh, instrument is very uh, trusted and uh, they directly buy uh, our suko. After they uh, put their order, they will uh, get receive a billing code and use the code for payment. And after they get uh, the code, billing code they uh, directly can doing the payment uh, and the investor will receive transaction number and notification of completed order and uh, before everything done uh, for payment they will uh, get confirmation that uh, their uh, order with will completed after that they will get a uh, confirmations for the uh, ownership of the retail bonds through uh, their emails. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, retail support development in Indonesia, actually we uh, have issued since 2009 uh, with two types of uh, instrument we call it suko retail which is the uh, tradable one and uh, the other series we call uh, saving suko or suko tabungan uh, which is non-tradable one we already issued 12, uh, 12 series retail suko with total investor uh, more than 300 uh, thousands investor uh, and we collect uh, amount as 177 uh, trillion IDR for uh, retail suko. And for uh, saving suko, we already issue six times with total investor 72,000 investor uh, and we collect 16 uh, trillion IDR. Who actually uh, buy uh, our suko? Investor come from various uh, professions. Fifty-five percent in, in from coming from uh, entrepreneur and uh, private employees. Twelve percent uh, coming from government uh, official. Ten percent uh, coming from housewife, and uh, twelve percent from student and uh, retired, and eleven percent from others. And uh, next, please. Next, this slide, uh, I will explain about why the government issue green suko retail. 
There are uh, several explanations. Uh, first, because uh, we are uh, aware that uh, government very concerned with the sustainability of uh, investor base. And the second, government of Indonesia puts a high effort in addressing environment uh, issues. So the government encourages green activities to uh, include it in our sovereign suku development. And lastly, green suku increase. Uh, we want to increase the level of awareness from individual uh, investor, especially for the millennial uh, on climate change and uh, environment issues. Next slide, please. Next slide, I would like to uh, explain about our study case for our debut Green Suko Retail 2019. Before we issue Green Suko Retail 2019, we already issue uh, green suko in the global market in 2018 and 2019. Uh, for the first issuance in 2018, uh, consider as the first uh, sovereign green suko in the world. Uh, and we already uh, received eight uh, international awards. But uh, green suko retail here, we issue with two years tenor with minimum uh, people can buy with the minimum size uh, 1 million uh, US uh, IDR or equivalent only 72 US dollar and maximum uh, size they can buy is uh, around 3 billion, 3 billion IDR or approximately uh, 216,000 uh, US dollar. This uh, instrument is non-tradable and uh, we found that during launching in November 2019, within uh, three weeks, uh, we gained an overwhelming response from investor with total issuance of uh, 1.46 trillion IDR. And uh, as Marin mentioned, for the Proceed of green suko, we uh, use hundred percent to finance and refinance eligible green sector in uh, accordance with the ROI green bond and green suko framework. In this case, uh, we finance uh, two sectors, which is resilience to climate change and energy efficiency. Amazingly, for this uh, case, uh, we tap a uh, new investor for millennial is more than 50% new investor is coming from millennial. That's a proof that uh, our online uh, platform grab uh, more millennial investor. Next slide, please. Here I want to show you uh, the green projects that we uh, finance from green from Proceed of green suko, not only from uh, retail suko, but we uh, here we put example from uh, global green suko as well. Here three uh, types of green project that uh, I uh, put here. First is uh, for energy efficiency uh, projects. We finance for installation of smart street uh, lighting integrated with solar power plant. And another example, uh, we use of green suko to finance renewable energy project through mini hydro power plant. And the third example, uh, I put it here is to help increasing resilience to climate change through installation to smart public street lighting. Next slide, please. This is uh, my uh, last slide. Uh, from experience, from our experience in issuing green retail suko, we found uh, 
several positive lesson from the online system in green suko retail issuance. First, uh, this is new system uh, is uh, for green suko retail and uh, using ID SID as a unique code. And uh, this system also uh, produce more categories of distribution agent, particularly from uh, fintech companies, because uh, from the on offline platform, we only appoint a bank and a securities companies without fintech companies. But by using a digital platform, we can uh, tap fintech companies. This uh, platform also uh, in increase book order from uh, wider uh, investor. We tap from eastern part of Indonesia uh, increase significantly through online system because uh, we can sell this uh, through online then people can buy from anywhere uh, without without a uh, restriction anymore and uh, online system also create more new investor especially millennial generations and as i mentioned uh, about more than 50 percent uh, new investor coming from millennial uh, generations and for uh, last advantage that we saw from uh, our uh, issuance, we saw that increased level of awareness from uh, individual investor, especially from uh, millennial, and attract uh, more green communities here, such as Trust Hero. So by uh, using online platform and a green platform now we uh, get in touch with trust hero trust hero is a green community who concerned about using plastic uh, for daily uh, life so they encourage people to use less plastic for daily life uh, Cecilia, I think uh, this is the last of my presentations. I will be happy to take any question uh, from uh, audience or from you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you very much for sharing your experience. I have one, one question for you. What advice would you give to other countries that were thinking of um, doing their own retail uh, green bond issuance? Yeah, uh, having successfully in issuing a uh, green suko uh, through a uh, online platform, I guess uh, other countries should start uh, from a government initiative because uh, when the government uh, have a new platform, then will encourage a company, a private company to do the same thing. For example, when we issue Green Suko uh, in 2018, then uh, followed by SOEs, they issue a Green Suko as well. But uh, for retail, uh, hopefully they will uh, do the same thing. So what I can suggest to other country, uh, the government should uh, take lead and uh, they have to do uh, retail suko or retail bonds through uh, online platform and encourage people uh, to do uh, the same thing and then i believe uh, will be followed by a corporate company uh, thank, thank you very much um now i'd like to pass the floor to my colleague vida to take us through the uh, discussion with the, the participants. Thank you. Hi, good morning again, everybody. This is uh, Annie. I would like to uh, introduce you to the Q&A session. 
uh, we are collecting uh, a lot of questions from the audience, so thank you uh, a lot for, for your interest and, uh, and uh, participation. Uh, we would also uh, like to uh, run in parallel, like to collect uh, your, your inputs on, on the future work that uh, um, we, we would like to, to have at the IA and at the OCD. So uh, we will then uh, move to, to Menti and leave as a background, uh, let's say, the opportunity for you to suggest anything if you'd like to. Uh, but now uh, we will uh, move on with um, the first question from the audience. Please, Vida. Thank you very much, Amy, and thank you, Cecilia, and thank you to our three excellent speakers for providing such uh, insightful uh, information about opportunities and, and uh, barriers. What I'd like to do is start off the discussion by zooming into some of the obstacles and barriers and ask all our speakers uh, what you believe is the main barrier to the ability of FinTech to scale up finance for clean energy and what we can overcome, what we can do to overcome this obstacle. So please, if we could start with Marianne, and then uh, followed by Jacob, and then uh, finally uh, Ibi Dwi. Yes, thank you. I think the one thing would be regulatory, lack of regulatory clarity on the regulation on a number of these underlying technologies, because the technology is there, but for a number of the markets where it will have the most impact, uh, especially developing markets, especially the African continent, we currently have a lack of regulatory clarity, especially on distribution fuel ledger technology. And we also have a lack of, of, of uh, 5G rollout. So I think those two are the main barriers as I see them. Thank you. And, and Jacob, please. From yeah, uh, I, I think uh, uh, a bit of education also would help. I mean, uh, in terms of the uh, tools today available. Uh, because I think uh, uh, if uh, if the people, the the government authorities, the uh, the regulators, uh, the people who are involved in such decision making, uh, have a, uh, the understanding and the uh, uh, the uh, ability to appreciate what these tools can provide. Uh, that would uh, uh, the transparency part and and the ideas around this this could uh, uh, actually help. Uh, them to make an informed decision, and I think that this is going to help a lot. Thank you, Jacob. And our uh, perspectives from Indonesia. Yeah, uh, thank you. I guess, uh, in my opinion, uh, I think literation is uh, the big thing. Literation to the people, uh, how we can uh, increase understanding uh, from the people about uh, the system itself and then uh, how we can uh, improve understanding on uh, and awareness how to do uh, together to combat uh, climate change and uh, using uh, energy efficiency. So uh, I believe and uh, we can do more uh, for now uh, having digital uh, platform such uh, seminar uh, using uh, webinar for example we can reach more people to uh, socialize uh, our uh, program for example and uh, give literations to uh, people that government have a strongly commitment uh, to combat uh, climate change, especially in uh, using uh, energy efficiency. And a uh, lot of program in Indonesia now can be financed through uh, SUKO. Uh, and uh, people uh, now getting uh, understand more uh, for our programs. So, uh, for example, we will issue more uh, green retail suko this year as well as uh, green suko in the global market so i think uh, the one will uh, help uh, us and uh, to get more finance to uh, do more for climate change thank you excellent thank you very much uh, i'll hand over to amy for the next question 
Thank you. So uh, one thing that uh, uh, I guess is really interesting both for us and for our audience is to, to actually contextualize uh, this, um, this fintech and evolution in the, the current COVID pandemic situation. So the question for all of you is, what impact do you think the COVID-19 pandemic will have on the development of fintech for financing sustainable infrastructure and clean energy projects? And if uh, social distancing and confinement measures would actually help to accelerate the development, or if you expect that the economic slowdown will halt this uh, development uh, as projects are delayed. So I will hand it over to you, Marianne, first, then Jacob and Vieri and T, as we did before. Thank you. Thank you. That's such a good question. I think for the, there are a number of, of really important points. I think for one is, uh, that we're currently seeing credit quality decreasing. So uh, for, for those types of, of rollout of renewable uh, in Africa, for instance, we, we are seeing credit quality uh, decreasing. So that will um, short term impact the access of people uh, to renewable energy. So there it would be really important that the government stimulus packages um, will enable uh, these people to do at least um, some breaks uh, in their in their down payments uh, on 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 their access to clean energy. Um, I think what we are seeing sort of at the broader fintech space is that the large fintech platforms are, are increasing uh, and they're they're getting bigger uh, during COVID nineteen. Uh, the small ones are suffering and a lot of them are exiting the market. Um, the big ones, so we will have more concentrated power in a smaller number of very large fintech players uh, because of the fact that exactly social distancing etc and is increasing their relevance and and it's just speeding up digitization speeding up historical processes and we're seeing a lot more remittances etc so so at the smaller innovator levels uh, we're seeing more uh, more disappear All right, thank you, Marianne. Jacob? Yeah, um, so yes, of course, there is a lot of stress in the market uh, from a financing standpoint. Uh, but I, th I think it's also a good opportunity to look at uh, uh, this as, an oppor as, a, as a chance for us to uh, invest into the future technologies, future, uh, uh, future itself, uh, uh, rather than invest in, in, in projects that are uh, probably in the in the past. Uh, so this can be an opportunity to see which projects do not make sense at this stage, uh, and then go forward uh, to 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 climate uh, energy projects and so on and so forth. So I think that's the first point. The second point is today, uh, you uh, especially for solar. I'm, I'm specifically talk, talking about solar energy projects or energy efficiency projects. There are projects which which have value. Uh, in stopping the older energy sources or stopping uh, the way that energy efficiency has been or en uh, energy has been handled and actually investing into today and uh, getting the returns for the next five years would probably be higher uh, than going back to the old uh, uh, situation. So I think uh, these sort uh, these discussions or these uh, this uh, this need to be reevaluated uh, and then investments could be made. This is what I feel. Thank you, Jacob. And last, Virianti. Uh, yes, I uh, believe that green bonds are not immune to COVID-19 impact. And having experienced several years of strong growth, the global green bond market is expected to face major hurdles this year as the world uh, continues to grapple with the economic fall out from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. However, I believe that uh, as social distancing is a major concern right now due to the COVID-19, then a digital green suko, I believe, is a good solution then. And uh, now in Indonesia, especially uh, people are ready uh, for this situation and they are already uh, know how to do and how to invest and uh, they already know that invest in green suko or green bond they will get uh, valued on it not only uh, for profit 
in term of finance, but also they uh, will get for better future for uh, their self. That's what I feel now. Perfect. Thank you, the Yirianti, and thank you all for your for your answers. Uh, actually, we know we're running a bit over time, but we would really uh, like to have at least uh, another round, let's say, of question for our speakers. So, uh, Vida, uh, please, you can proceed with the next one. Yes, thank you all very much for your patience and, and staying with us. We want to take this opportunity now that we have such three uh, great experts online to, to take the opportunity to query them further. So starting with Marianne, could you tell us uh, a bit more about country experiences uh, with the use of fintech for um, financing clean energy projects and, and share with us some of the main lessons learned from these transactions and uh, projects? Yeah, most of the country experiences are in the access to energy rather than in the energy efficiency space. But there are a few that are in the energy efficiency space. Um, one of them is uh, in Germany. That's that was for for LED lightning, and that was actually uh, outside of of Germany. And that was a um, a crowdfunded transaction, uh, which was for a public building. Uh, it was a 10-year maturity. The I think the return was three to four percent. Um, so that was um, for a public uh, a public building where that was the the energy efficiency costs were not part of, of the budget. So they managed to get it through crowdfunding, and that's um, we see most of the energy or the country experiences with these types of crowdfunding platforms are within the same jurisdiction. People want to be close to the project. So this was one that. Um, where it was more of a sort of ordinary transactions in the mind of the people. Uh, so it was just more about the return and, and, and making, uh, making, uh, making an impact. So um, what we see is that regulatory and policy environment is really sort of uh, what, what triggers it. Uh, you need to have, um, and you need to not have comp too much competition from concessional funding. Uh, that, is, that is extremely important. Um, then we have seen, if we move to, to the developing world, uh, that is mainly rollout of, um, of energy access. Uh, so MCOPA, which is the most scaled rollout of um, solar energy, which is uh, also a part of our alliance. Um, it, it took them actually uh, uh, seven years to start to make a profit. So, um, so it is a long-term game. Um, and for them, they see them much more as a fintech uh, company than as a rollout of, of, of renewable energy or energy efficiency company. So it's really about getting, getting the fintech model right, but they have actually enabled deployment of capital into remote communities that, and, and now they are transitioning from sort of the impact investor base to much more sort of uh, mainstream finance, uh, bank finance, et cetera. So they have really exited into that. Uh, and if we look at energy efficiency on the African continent, we, we can see a number of them that are focusing on, on the agricultural value chain. And what is really interesting about those is that they have a high employment impact as well, uh, because making the value, agricultural value chain more energy efficiency, efficient uh, has sometimes increases labor input. So, so it's a, it's a co-benefit solution. Uh, but also for those market working on the uh, policy and regulatory environment is uh, is key. I'll stop here. Thanks so much, Maria. Um, Amy, I know you have a question for Jacob. Yeah, so uh, we'd like to, uh, to move next to zooming in a bit more on the Asian uh, geography. And, um, and actually, uh, we would like to, to know from you, Jacob, what is the status of fintech for financing clean energy or sustainable infrastructure in India? And uh, more broadly, which markets in Asia do you feel have the largest potential for using fintech to help scale of green finance? And, and please elaborate on why is that? Sure. Uh, so first of all, we use uh, DLT as our base of our technology. Uh, so there is a um, uh, the, 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 
fintech is a broad term and uh, dlt is one way that you can implement or blockchain dlt is one way that you can implement there are the conventional ways of implementing it so i think it's good to differentiate between the two uh, so the conventional way of normal servers and implementation of that is happening and there are crowdfunding platforms there is a uh, there are uh, uh, there are some regulations in place from uh, the Indian authorities as well on crowdfunding, um, but it is not really taken off in, in 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 for the scale of the country and for the scale of the projects that are there um, for various reasons. Um, but if you look at from a DLT standpoint, from a blockchain standpoint, which is where there is a lot of value that is coming in. Uh, that is a bit more uh, in an early stage because uh, the, 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 there's, a, there's a bunch of regulations that are needed. And when one talks about tokens or ICO or any of those aspects, uh, then uh, the regulators and the government uh, uh, are very, uh, you know, very worried about those, uh, those aspects of, of, of DLT. Uh, so, um, uh, so the, the, from from that standpoint, it is it, it it's probably a little bit further down uh, the road, uh, uh, but from uh, from the standpoint of in Southeast Asia, there are some countries who are uh, a, a bit ahead from from a standpoint of regulation, from a standpoint of um, uh, acceptance of of these technologies. Uh, uh, so countries like Singapore uh, come to mind, and and uh, th th there's more. Uh, uh, more uh, encouragement from the uh, from from those jurisdictions. Um, uh, this this is a, a work in progress uh, uh, project. So I think that over a period of time, this is uh, the the information is going to be disseminated. People are going to see more projects coming online. They are see, going to see value, and over a period of time, uh, this is this is going to develop because the the the, the value is definitely there. And the value is derived even without without any loss of uh, uh, of credit uh, using the same balance sheet. So it, 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 there there is definitely value, and and uh, it's only a matter of time. That that's that's what I what what I have to say. Thank you. Yeah, and of course, like we will see how the situation evolves. As we we, we said earlier, that the current pandemic is actually affecting the sector, of course. So we would like to move on to our next question uh, for Ibu Duirianti. So I will leave the floor to Vida, please. Thanks, Jacob, and thanks, Amy. So, so our final question: um, could, uh, could you tell us a bit more about uh, your plans? Are you, for instance, uh, looking to support uh, corporate, uh, including financial institution issuances of green bonds or green sooks? And if there are any um, plans to, to work together on an ASEAN uh, level in this area. Okay, thank you. Uh, actually, uh, for our plan to uh, do more with uh, blended finance, uh, we already have Indonesian one uh, plan uh, which is uh, blended finance, we can uh, do together to get uh, more impact. Uh, the blended finance can be uh, from government side through uh, SUCO or bonds, and then uh, we encourage uh, SOE or private company as well as uh, we ask for a direct loan from uh, other country to finance uh, such uh, projects to support uh, energy efficiency as well as renewable uh, energy. And uh, as part of our innovations for SUKO, actually we have a program, we call it a project with SUKO. We issue SUKO to finance uh, many projects, many buildings since 2013. And uh, we think that uh, in the next future, we will uh, ask to uh, line ministries to build uh, not just building, but uh, we will ask them to uh, build a green 
uh, building. So uh, I think that one can support uh, <clears throat> the program of uh, renewable energy as well as uh, energy efficiency. Thank you very much for, for this information. And uh, from my side, thank you to our three excellent speakers. I'll hand over now to Cecilia and Annie to wrap up the webinar. And of course, thank you to all participants. Thank you very much, Vida. Um, and I'd like to thank the participants for their suggestions of future work that the OECD and IEA could undertake in the space of using FinTech um, to support more clean energy um, finance. Uh, our discussions today were, were extremely rich. I'm not going to attempt to summarize everything, but I would like to leave you with um, what I see as some of uh, the three main takeaways from the webinar. Uh, first of all, FinTech for clean energy finance is at its nascent stage with only uh, a glimmer of its potential seen so far. Country experience remains limited. The potential, however, for digitalization to transform the way clean energy finance projects um, are financed is extremely <laughs> exciting. Uh, secondly, blockchain uh, and DLTs, uh, IoT and AI provide visibility on data and analytics that can really help drive down transaction costs by facilitating standardization of smaller projects, uh, making project due diligence easier and less costly. Uh, FinTech also allows uh, greater access to smaller projects to raise capital at lower costs. And the provision of real-time performance data makes it easier for investors to evaluate and risk and also leads to more confidence in project returns. And then finally, um, governments have a, a key role to play in developing some of the early projects and also in providing the right policy environment and governance structures that can really allow fintech to grow, but at the same time provide investors with sufficient protection and also information to make informed uh, investment decisions. Um, I'd like to, to end by thanking all of our speakers for joining us today and for sharing their experience um, and for their excellent presentations. Uh, I'd like to thank the participants for joining us and the IEA team for their support. I uh, wish everyone well and good health. And now I'd like to pass back to Emmy for, for the final word. Yeah, thank you, uh, Cecilia. So once again, thank you all speakers uh, to our participants and to, to our colleagues who made this possible. Um, I hope that the, this webinar was in, insightful for you all. And, and actually, this is an exciting month for the year. A lot of uh, events coming up that you can also find on our website calendar. But I would like to point out some of those. For instance, this afternoon, we'll hear about Voltalis' experience on operating flexibility for more than 100,000 households in France. And uh, coming up uh, in the week on, of the 23 of June, we also have our annual global conference on energy efficiency. A lot of prominent speakers there, and there will actually be the chance to participate remotely, which uh, didn't happen, of course, the past year. So this would actually be a great chance to hear from uh, thought leaderships on um, on how uh, energy efficiency is actually um, taking shape in the picture of economic recovery and, and what are the, the current global best practices and partnerships. Uh, in the same week, we will also hold uh, a webinar on energy innovations for, for the city of tomorrow. And our series of events will actually culminate with the Clean Energy Transition Summit, which will be a ministerial summit focused on, on, on this topic on the 9th of July. So please stay tuned on our social media channels and website calendar. And of course, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.